Okay, good morning, lovely people of OCB. Thanks for being here on Thursday morning. Pat yourselves on the back. Um, so I'm Karen Stamieshkin. I'm from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, I'm in Debbie Steinberg's lab, and I work right now with Debbie and Amy on the exports project. Uh, my other co-author of this talk here, Philip, um, he's currently gallivanting around the Swiss Alps studying trees or something, but at some point <laughs> he was working on questions about uh, zooplankton or copepod mediated carbon flux. Um, so he uh, and I both worked on a model that I'll be presenting today. Um, so I want to just start out introducing our biological carbon pump, and I know some of you probably know a lot about this, and some of you may not know much at all. So just generally the biological carbon pump is the set of processes um, through which biology works on inorganic carbon in the surface waters and then um, through various pathways exports it uh, deeper into the ocean. So I focus on zooplankton related pathways. Uh, and so one of those pathways is what we call passive flux, which consists of sinking uh, material. It could be sinking fecal pellets. It could also be sinking carcasses of zooplankton or um, other products like the mucus webs that Amy mentioned. Uh, but basically, this is a passive pathway uh, where um, particulate organic carbon is sinking from the surface waters deeper into the ocean. Oops. Um, so then another pathway is what we call active flux. And there are two types of active flux that I'm going to mention today. One is uh, the, the called diel vertical migration, uh, or it's related to diel vertical migration of zooplankton. Um, and so that happens when zooplankton that are, I can see why people were having trouble with this thing. Um, <laughs> when zooplankton that are feeding up at the surface at night um, migrate deeper into the water during the day. Um, and while they're down there, they're respiring, they're excreting, whatever else they're doing. Um, and then, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, but then there's also a seasonal vertical migration where those zooplankton, um, certain species of those zooplankton actually go into what we call diapause and they migrate to hundreds of meters of depth and hang out for months uh, as part of their life cycle or part of their ontogenetic um, process. So I'm gonna give you an outline because this talk bounces around a little bit and what I'm trying to do is make a story for modelers to teach them about how hard it is to collect experimental data and make a story for experimentalists to show them how we incorporate experimental data into models. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, we've already got through the biological carbon pump. Uh, I'm going to introduce ex or talk about exports again. It's been introduced a few times, um, but that's a field campaign to quantify the biological carbon pump in great detail and then relate it to satellite data. Uh, then I'll talk about modeling those three flux pathways for copepods. Um, copepods are crustaceans, zooplankton, and they tend to be a favorite organism because, as Amy mentioned, we have so many studies about them. They're crunchy. They don't die when we put them in containers. Um, so I'll be focusing on copepods, but I'll talk about those three flux pathways in a model. And I'll um, give you the results of that model, which is size-based, um, applied to the North Atlantic Ocean. And then I'm going to zero in on one particular species of copepod that we looked at in the North Pacific and actually apply some of the um, equations that we used in the model to that species to see, and then compare that to the rates that we measured to see how well our modeled um, carbon flux uh, variables relate to our measured variables. And then I will conclude. All right, so exports. Um, Zooplankton mediated export is important. We know that it's important, but it's really difficult to measure on the scale that we need to to quantify it for the whole world, for the whole biological carbon pump. So exports was a great example of just how difficult this is. So we went out, we had two research vessels, we had a ton of autonomous platforms, we had different sediment traps, we had like 60 scientists or something like that. Um, you know, it was a huge effort, and it's a worthwhile effort because we need to collect those data points. But that data set that we now have and are working with represents the biological carbon pump in one location at one time of year in one year. So we have this great data set that we want to try to extrapolate um, to a larger area, and that's the goal of exports. 
but it's just a huge amount of resources and time and energy put into learning about the biological carbon pump. So the alternative to that, I shouldn't say alternative, um, the other side of that, you know, we need to do both, but the other option is to model it. Um, so several years ago, I worked on a model, a simple size-based model to look at passive um, flux. So that, just to remind you, we have our sinking fecal pellets from zooplankton feeding at the surface. That's considered um, part of our passive flux. So this model um, really focused on size as a master trait. And size works really well for this because, as we've heard, it relates directly to metabolism. It also relates to sinking rate. So in general, I know there are lots of caveats, but in general, larger particles sink faster than smaller particles. Um, so this is a schematic of the model that we put together. Oh, okay. Um, we had uh, some field data. So we had copepod concentration, um, and also we had, you know, we had the different species. We have temperature, and with those two things, we can basically use size, which prosome length is a type, type of um, size for measuring, or it's a way to measure size in zooplankton. Um, so we have that. That relates to the fecal pellet volume. Um, temperature and size relates to the fecal pellet production rate of the zooplankton because of metabolic scaling. And um, you can kind of trace this through, and eventually we get basically fecal pellet carbon um, flux. So um, this is an example of a small model that uses size to quantify passive flux. So then we took it a step further, and we wanted to include the active flux pathways that I mentioned and apply it to a much larger region. Um, so this paper came out this year, uh, and it includes a more um, complicated model to describe vertical migration behavior, but it's still based on size in a lot of ways. Um, but it's a fitness optimization, uh, and there's a trade-off. It includes the trade-off between feeding at the surface and potentially being eaten. So I'll walk you through this in the schematic here. Um, so we'll start here in the dark. This is nighttime, and we have time on the x-axis here. Basically, the darker is night and the brighter is day. Um, so we have zooplankton hanging out at the surface, eating at night. Um, then during the day, along come our visual predators. The zooplankton migrate deeper into the water column. While they're down there, they're, like I said, breathing, excreting, and everything. Um, and then darkness comes, and they migrate back up. Um, so the way size relates to this is that it impacts swimming efficiency. It can impact feeding rate. It also impacts the likelihood of being eaten by something else or who will eat you. And of course, it impacts our metabolic processes. Um, so then the other active flux pathway that I mentioned is this seasonal migration or ontogenetic migration that some species of copepod undergo. Um, uh, so on this axis here, again, we have time, and it's broken up by whether you're feeding, hibernating, or feeding. Um, and then we have season indicated up here. And essentially what it's showing is that uh, certain species hang out at the surface during the times of year when there's lots of food and relatively few predators. Um, then when the predator community starts to build up and food becomes less available, they go down deep into the water column and hibernate or go into diapause. And while they're down there, they can die. Um, there are actually two different types of strategies among the large calanoid copepods, of which this is one. This is a really finicky pointer. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Um, so, some species of, cal of calanoid copepod will go into hibernation, and while they're down there, they'll produce their eggs and then die, and those eggs will develop into nauplii and copepidids that will make their way up into the surface waters um, for the next generation. Other species will hibernate or go into diapause and then actually go back up to the surface, then spawn, creating the next generation. Um, so there's a few different strategies for this. Um, this for anyone who's not seen a copepod, you can never say that again. <laughs> I don't know if there's anyone in this room like that, but this is Calanus finmarchicus, an important copepod in the North Atlantic Ocean. And I should say for people out there, it's one of the important copepods. It gets a lot of extra attention, but um, it's one of the important ones. So Calanus is a major diapause species, and in the North Atlantic, there are a few others um, that use diapause as a strategy. Okay, so um, results from this study, which I think are really neat. These, were, these um, models were applied to the continuous plankton recorder time series, which is 
a really fantastic data set because it's so long term. There's arguably a lot of issues with the data set as well, but um, it's, it's what we've got and it's really, I think it's a fantastic data set. Um, okay. On the top left, we have, um, so that's modeled fecal pellet flux from our CocoPod community. Um, and then on the bottom, it's the active diel vertical migration flux. So if you remember, that's more related to respiration, primarily related to respiration at depth. And you can see that those are both higher along the northwestern margins of the study area. And then on the right, we have change in those two um, parameters, or those two variables, um, over the last several decades. And the pattern is generally that along the northwestern margin, we have an increase in those flux pathways, whereas in the eastern and southern part of the study region, we have a decrease. And then the last, or the third flux pathway that I want to mention, um, the diapause flux or the um, seasonal migration flux, you can see that it's strongest again along that um, northwestern boundary um, and it's increasing and decreasing, but mainly increasing in a similar pattern um, and decreasing uh, further south. Um, and what we found is that when we just looked at what inputs into the model correlated str most strongly with these changes, we found that it's change in biomass. So it's really these large, abundant species that are driving these patterns. Um, and based on other literature, we've seen that these Calanus species, especially Calanus finmargicus, is actually shifting further north. So this has been its range, um, but the con larger concentrations of the species are actually shifting further and further north due to changes in ocean um, temperature and structure. So we found that really it's this distribution of these important species that are driving change in the um, cocoa mediated um, carbon pump. Okay, so shifting gears to some field work. Um, the exports cruise that we went on this past summer, almost a year ago now, was in the North Pacific. Uh, one of the large uh, analogs, the large copepod analogs to Calanus fumarchicus and other Calanus species in the North Pacific is this guy, Neocalanus cristatus. Uh, that's its range there on the top left. I want to show a video to you so you can even say you've been to, or you haven't been to sea, you've seen copepods at sea. You can say that now. <laughs> Um, so you can see they have these beautiful red colors. They're really big. So these are much bigger than the Calanus vimarchicus. They're like seven millimeters long. Easy to see with the naked eye. And um, they're just very elegant and beautiful little guys. Let me zoom in. All right, so note the red color. Why don't you just keep the red in your mind? All right, so how do we actually measure these important rates that I'm talking about? So for pe the fecal pellet production, um, we created these cool experimental chambers. Um, and again, this is to emphasize just how much goes into collecting these data points. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, so we have an insert inside this container that contains our zooplankton. They're swimming around, pooping and everything in there. And then the poops fall out the mesh in the bottom of that insert um, so that we can then collect them and analyze the carbon content. Um, and then we also did mock nest toes, so there you can see, I think that's Debbie. Um, so that's Debbie standing next to the mock nest. The mock nest is an enormous net with many different nets on it. We deploy it and close each net at different depths in order to get the distribution of these zooplankton. So then we can apply the rates that we measure to the animals that we count. Um, and then respiration experiments. So these were done by Amy Moss and her technician Andrea Nicoli. Um, and so we were collecting animals, putting them into these little chambers and measuring their breathing. And again, applying that rate to uh, what we got in the surveys there. So here's what we measured for active respiratory flux. Um, I wanted to show this acoustic profile quickly. I'm kind of running out of time, but um, basically what's neat about this is you can see the vertical migration of this um, different layers of plankton, right? So we have a shallow layer up here that's migrating um, down and up. We have a few different layers. Uh, and each line there represents midday. So you can get an idea that, oh, this really happens. It's not theoretical. Um, so what we measured, that's what we measured for the respiratory flux um, for the um, vertically migrating Neocalanus cristatus. 
And then when I put that into the model, we find that what the model predicts is an order of magnitude smaller. So in this case, our size-based model didn't really match up with what we measured in the field. But as my friend Heather McNair says, what's an order of magnitude between friends? <laughs> um, so for passive fecal pellet flux, um, we measured, we can't do an exact comparison, but we measured the fecal pellet production by Neocalanus crostatus in the upper 100 meters. Um, now if we assume that they're only feeding at night as a vertically migrating copepod would do, we get this. The model predicts that flux out of 100 meters would be about 1.4 milligrams of carbon per square meter per day. So that matches up pretty well. Um, but we also realized that this vertical migration that they were doing was much shorter than you would normally expect. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but basically we thought they could actually be feeding during the day and at night. It's not your typical setup of vertical migration. So um, when you assume that they're feeding day and night, the measurements that we took and the model really compare very favorably. So now I'll quickly talk about their vertical migration. Um, so this plot on the top left here is showing the yellow is the daytime concentration of Neocalanus cristatus, and so you can see they're concentrated in this 50 to 100 meter layer. Um, and then on the right at night, they migrate up um, into that surface layer. And the reason I wanted you to note that red color was because you can really see that in our toes. So these are the buckets of zooplankton we collected from our mock nest toes. And you can see that um, that red color is super apparent in that lower layer at, during the day, and then they migrate up at night. Um, and again, I wanted to show this profile because you can actually see that layer um, moving within the upper 100 meters. Um, so in order to see whether size can really predict that vertical migration behavior, I actually used um, a different, simpler model for this purpose um, by Mark Ullman and um, Jean-Baptiste Romagnon. Um, so they took the size of a bunch of copepods from off of the coast of California, and they looked at the day and night distribution and um, amplitude of that migration for the different size classes. And they found this really nice nonlinear relationship between size um, and daytime distribution, which is, <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> so here's our daytime distribution of the different size classes. So the size classes along the x-axis, and then our nighttime distribution, and then the amplitude of that migration. And so our Neocalanus cristatus fall about here. Um, and then and they had some nice equations that describe these uh, lines. Um, and so when I applied those equations, what they predicted was that um, Neocalanus cristatus would be migrating about 65 to 70 meters per day, which actually matches pretty well with our amplitude, uh, but the actual depth they predicted was much deeper than where we found them. And the reason I expect that maybe is related to the optical environment. So they also describe an, a relationship with the optical environment um, and DVM amplitude where basically the um, light attenuation, which is represented on the x-axis, relates to um, how much the zooplankton are going to migrate up and down. And they had this nice linear relationship. And when I applied our um, something similar to this attenuation coefficient that we measured in the field, um, it predicted that the DVM amplitude would be about 100 meters, which, you know, ours was between 50 and 100. So that's it's okay. So this worked all right. Um, I think the main discrepancy that we have is really where they are in the water column, not how far they're migrating. And I, this might be explained by the fact that it was cloudy for the entire cruise. I think we had a few hours of sunlight on like three days. So um, that may be altering the, um, uh, the light field as well, maybe making it so they can be higher in the water column without getting eaten by visual predators. So in this case, a size-based simple model does okay at describing the vertical migration behavior, but maybe needs to be modified by the optical environment um, and the fact that it was super cloudy. So just to summarize these findings from the different methods, um, the respiratory flux really doesn't compare super well to the model estimate, or sorry, the model estimate doesn't compare <laughs> super favorably to the field measurement. Um, for our fecal pellet passive flux, I think that the size-based model does a really nice job. And then with DVM amplitude, it works, you know, the size-based idea works pretty well. Um, however, 
the actual depth of the organism seems to be modified by things much more complicated than size or even just the simple light field, but maybe more about the local light conditions and weather and all that. Um, so to conclude, I would, I hope this makes the case that modeling really needs field work and field work needs modeling. I think both of these things together are super important and I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Um, but it's really nice to be able to make direct comparisons and I find that that's kind of rare. So does size suffice? I would say it does for some of the things that we were looking at and it doesn't for others. So for respiration, for that vertical migration flux, it just didn't do that well. Um, and there are some other interesting traits that we could consider um, that we'll talk about in the discussion. And then my, the last question I have, you know, I focused on Neocalanus cristatus because it's a great big giant crusty copepod, but what about other things? Um, this is a pteropod or a sea uh, open ocean snail that um, Trisha mentioned in her lightning talk that we found. We also had huge amounts of salp, so gelatinous plankton. And so um, we definitely need to think more about how to include those in, um, in size-based frameworks. Thanks. Hi, I'm wondering how good my math is this morning, but if it's any good, it's trying to relate your carbon flux from pellets and other uh, zooplankton activities to the numbers that uh, Ken Bissler has on a po had on a poster, and is the fraction of carbon uh, export by this uh, by the, by these processes uh, five to ten to fifteen percent? Is that is that about? Was my math good? Yeah. Is that the is that what we get at Bermuda? What are zooplankton different? here than they are in Bermuda? Is that also about five to 10 to? So Bermuda is, I would say, it's not the same, but it's a somewhat similar system. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of kind of globally how important zooplankton are. Um, well, so I'll say that the zooplankton portion of the biological pump, I think, accounts for a, th is it a quarter. I should have looked this up. But some people say it actually accounts for the amount of carbon dioxide that humans are emitting in a year. So like they're on par with each other. Um, I've also seen that maybe it's more like a quarter of what humans are emitting per year. So I'd say it's important. Um, relative to other parts of the ocean, I think it, you know, it varies a lot. And this is definitely, it's not an oligotrophic system, but it's a near oligotrophic system. Um, and I did, yeah, I, I was running out of time, so I didn't mention this. This is the thorium-derived particulate organic carbon flux um, that Ken's group measured. And so you can see that the respiratory flux of this one copepod species is pretty high compared, you know, yeah, it's relatively important when you're looking at compared to POC flux, yeah. Trisha Thibodeau, Vims, nice job, Karen. I was curious, since size doesn't explain some of the fluxes, what other traits you think might instead? Yeah, it's a good question. So in terms of the discrepancy between respiratory flux and the, um, the field measurement and the model, I'm not sure exactly why that's like that and what trait would help boost that accuracy. Um, I was actually talking to someone at the break that it seems like as far as like metabolism or basal metabolism goes, size does, I mean, especially for crustacean zooplankton, size does a really good job, you know, on a small scale. Um, as far as the other pathways go, I think that, I do think diapause is a really interesting trait to look at and diapause strategy could really impact um, estimates of the biological carbon pump because you know, that's a really strong process where there a large amount of biomass are just going down and whether they stay down um, and then die down there or come back up to make the next generation, that's, a really, that's gonna really impact how much biomass, how much carbon is where in the water column. So I think diapause would be a really good trait to look at. <laughs> 